I want to talk today about technology, wealth, and culture, and their relationship to Africa as a continent. When I started doing what I'm doing now, I was propelled along that road by two things that happened to me. The first of which was I read an article by John Perry Barlow in Wired magazine called The Internet in Africa. And I thought about half of this was complete, completely crazy. And the other half was really very, very interesting. The basic assumption of this article was that Africa could move from being essentially agricultural and peasant societies, skipping this bit, the smokestack culture of in the Industrial Revolution, to getting to post-industrial, post-modern society, going from producer to service economy, and finding through technology something that could be done in, to create wealth within the continent. The second thing that happened to me was that I went to a supper party, and a quite senior person in an NGO said, why does Burkina Faso have to sell its crops? Why can't it feed its people? And there happened to be around that table a development economist, and if you know economists, they go on at great length, and he explained the world trade system. And at the end of this rather lengthy diatribe, we then got to talking about what was it that perhaps technology might do that would help contribute to a country like Burkina Faso making its way in the world in some economic sense. So that's what I want to talk about today. And I want to talk about technology not in the sense of the kinds of things that people in the development sector often talk about. I don't want to talk about one laptop per child. I don't want to talk about agricultural pricing systems. These are all wonderful, good things. But these are window openers. They give you some idea of the potential of technology. What I want to talk about today are door openers of fundamental change, things that will make things very, very different. The first of these door openers is to talk about selling shortage and corruption. When I first started doing what I was doing, what I'm doing in Africa, people were buying fixed phones, and in order to buy the fixed phones, they had to fill in usually forms in triplicate, attach a photograph, find a district official to sign the, the, the form, put the form into the phone company, which was a monopoly run by the government, and maybe two, three years later, they would get their phone. Now, if you paid a bribe, you could get ahead in the queue, so you could actually get your phone immediately. And I became fascinated by how much people were paying. So you would pay $10, $20, $30 $10, to, to get your phone installed. Now, scroll forward six years, and actually what has happened is that an African in any country in Africa can walk into a mobile phone outlet, and for the downlay of perhaps $3, can walk out, have a phone, and be immediately talking to their mother, their father, their relatives, their children, their work colleagues. Just like that. No bribe needs to be paid. Now, we were all agonizing about how do you get rid of corruption. This got rid of corruption. Nobody bribes to buy a mobile phone. You simply walk into a shop. So you go from selling shortage to having plenty. Now, I ask you all to think, are there other areas of African life where this same principle can be applied, because it seems to me that in that way you suck corruption out of parts of the system. The second part of selling shortage is to do with price elasticity. That's another economist's fancy term. What does this mean? Well, it means that when mobiles were first available on the continent, you would pay, say, $1,300 to get one. Now, as I said before, you pay $3. The difference is thousands were able to use them, and now millions and hundreds of millions are able to use them. But we're not at the end of that price curve. As you bring the price down, more people are able to afford it. And if we keep doing that, we're probably about two-thirds of the way through the process, then more and more people will be able to use those phones. There was a survey conducted in a suburb of Nairobi, which has already been mentioned, Kibera. And I say a suburb. This is what is laughingly described as an informal settlement, a slum. People live in tin shacks. And there's three quarters of a million live there. This is like a, the, Victorian pre, the Victorian industrial city. And out of these places will become the future of the city. And it, this survey discovered that four people share a mobile phone. So I talked to my development friends, and they all say, aren't Africans ingenious in sharing in the face of adversity? 
Nonsense. This is actually a market going begging. This is people who are not being served at the price they can afford. And I would contend that two out of those four can be enfranchised by the market. At the moment, the average revenue per user, which is the industry's technical term for actually describing this revenue, ARPUs, is actually between $10 to $15. In India, those ARPUs are down to $4 to $7. So we've still got a ways to come down in terms of price, and that means that the number of people using phones will continue to go up. Now, if you look at the new technologies that are becoming available, wireless and mobile voice over IP, then I believe that you will see low-cost niche voice operators because it is extremely difficult for the mobile operators to cannibalize their own existing high revenues. Some may be able to do it, but not all of them. And if you look at companies like Local in Brazil, you see, in a sense, the prefiguration of this trend. So that's selling shortage and corruption. Now, the second door opener, bandwidth is the fuel of the new economy. It's like the petrol. And if you look at Africa and this map of Africa, you will see that there is a single cable connecting Africa internationally to the rest of the world. This is SAT-3. It is the only cable worth talking about on the continent. It only goes down the west coast of the continent. It was built by a shareholder consortium, and its African members were all incumbent telcos, and they all have monopolies in their own country. As a result, when they first started selling this bandwidth, they sold it at $25,000 per megabit per second per month. And I'm not going to keep repeating that, so when I say a number, that's what I mean. This price has now come down to $10,000 to $15,000 at the expensive end and $1,600 at the lower end. Now, there was a price investigation in Mauritius, which is an Indian Ocean island right out on the far end of the cable, and as a result of the price investigation by the regulator, the price was brought down to $3,000. Now, why does any of this matter? Well, I was sitting at supper last night with the owner of an Angolan ISP who was saying he wished he could lower the prices that he was offering to his customers because the, the, he would then be able to sell to more customers. And we were joined by a young guy running an American software company. He explained what he did. And he said, well, completely unprompted, I wish I could bring some of my software programming to Kenya, but the bandwidth price, man, it's so expensive, we just can't do it. So actually, high-priced bandwidth keeps business out of the continent. Now, we have been campaigning for open and fair access to international bandwidth of this kind. When I say we, I should mention two individuals who are in the room, Joseph Mushero and Eric Osiarquin, both of whom have formed part of a network of Africans who have been bringing this change about. So we have a situation on the east coast of Africa where four cables are going to arrive, all of them working under some version of open access principles, and all offering a starting price of between $500 to $1,000. So you can begin to see that the continent is now ready to take part in the global conversation because it has that bandwidth fuel. Okay, the next door opener. I want to, I want to ask the audience, how many of you own, can I have the lights up slightly so I can see people's hands? How many of you own a Rolls Royce? I saw a guy with a t-shirt, so I thought maybe he owned one. No, he's only got the t-shirt, he hasn't got the car. Fine, okay. That's high cost, low volume. That's the mentality of selling shortage. Low cost, high volume. How many of you have bought a budget airline ticket? Show of hands. Okay, very simply, that's low cost, high volume. So that's what we're looking at. This is the transition I've already described that took place with mobile. Now, if you're African, you're going to be sitting here looking at me and saying, well, it's all very well saying that you know, broadband is going to come and, and voice over IP and all of these kinds of things. Who on earth is going to buy it, man? So let me give you the example of Kenya. Kenya has 32 million people. Of those 32 million people, 2 million have bank accounts. And half a million have property of a sufficient value that would suggest that they should be ripe candidates to buy broadband. So 
But people are out there. There's an emergent middle class. This is the beginning. This is the start. And you will see this emergent middle class in Kenya, Senegal, Nigeria, places like that. It's already happening. I want to give you a, a portent of the future. When Kenya put its exam results online for secondary students, there were 655,000 exam results. 250,000 students went online to look at those exam results. So that is the, what the, one of the earlier speakers was talking about as the cheetah generation. I have no idea what animal that generation is going to be, but they are going to be very different to the current generation. So we go on to the next of the door openers. This is the Hall of Fame. Sani Abacha, Emperor Bakasa, Mobuti Sesiseko, all the great guys, the big men, the Wabenzi. Now, I observed when I looked at the telecom sector in Africa as I traveled around, you would find a circumstance in which the president of a particular country that will remain nameless, his wife was the shareholder in the leading satellite reseller in another country. The daughter of the president was the owner of the leading GSM operator. I could give you several examples. Sometimes cutouts are used, so you can't actually see it, but actually it occurs. The government is deeply involved in a particular set of decisions in terms of business. It has its fingers in the pot. Now, what you have in Africa is a kind of monopoly franchise capitalism. So I get given the franchise for BMW cars. I'm the only guy who sells them. Therefore, I can sell them pretty much as expensively as I like. And of course, there are ways around this, but that's, that's the general principle. Now, what happened about five years ago was something called the African ISP Association was set up and began to campaign for people getting licenses and competition in the market who weren't the usual suspects, who weren't the friends and relatives of the men in power. And this has caused a, a broadening of the business ecology within a lot of countries. So for instance, in South Africa, due to a lot of other forces as well, there are 366 companies that are known as value-added network providers. In Kenya, there are probably somewhere between 30 and 50 companies. Now, this is not true of all countries, but if you have this diverse business ecology and you have an independent regulator, decisions which you would call in, in where I come from, stitched up decisions, are open to discussion. They're challengeable. People debate how a decision is made and who gets the prize at the end of the process. And this same liberalization and, and deepening of and, and making more complex, in a sense, the business sector is happening within media. So if you looked at Uganda 15 years ago, it had a handful of radio stations, and now it has 1,500 plus radio stations. So you can see something is happening. Now, this technological revolution, like the industrial revolution, is not really just about technology. It's about social and cultural relations. If we go back to that Stone Age tribe that we were hearing about yesterday, a particular Stone Age tribe, and one of the guys goes off traveling, and in those days there were no mobile phones, so he comes back and he has to walk all the way back and tell them the message. He says, guys, the tribe up the road, they've got bronze axes. We've only got stone ones, but with these guys have got bronze axes. They're really good at killing people, and, and they'll defend us, and they're good at killing animals, so we should be making bronze axes. And he's pitching away to the tribe and you know, expel, you know, giving all the advantages of having bronze axes and how good they are. And a guy puts his hand up at the back and says, excuse me, what are the stone chippers going to do? I don't want to be a bronze smelter. That's dangerous work. What are we going to do, us stone chippers? So technological revolutions have winners and losers. And the stone chippers in the telecom sector are the several thousand Kenya telecom messengers who have recently been made redundant. So if you have winners and losers, how do you persuade people that there is a better life? How, in a sense, do you say to them, there is a prize at the end of this? There is pain, but there is prize, a prize at the end of this. And this is a discussion about traditional versus modern. This is Abuja, which is the capital of Nigeria. And Nigerians, if you talk to them about Abuja, they will say, ah, Abuja, this is not Nigeria. This is America. If you drive the road from Johannesburg to Pretoria, 
big freeway, come going home time, traffic jams, just like Los Angeles, smart car dealerships, big high-tech buildings. I'm not in Africa, really. Something's happening, but I'm not in Africa. So what is it that modern Africa will look like? What will the look and feel of modern Africa be like? I don't know the answer to that question, but I think that's quite important, because if you're going to persuade people that the better life is worth having, what are you telling them that it is? This is Nelson Mandela in the Santon Mall, and people go and have their photograph taken underneath it. And this is sort of a blending of the traditional and the modern. And one day, African tourists in great numbers will go and have their picture taken in the Santon Mall, because they will have enough money to travel within the continent more widely. Now, this is a very badly executed design idea. But, wait, but wait with me, here. Burkina Faso academic, Silvestro Wedrago, did this with his kids in the project he runs. The point about this is it's not just about owning a computer, it's about possessing the idea. So if somebody like Omatech can actually make an African-designed computer that people can identify with that is theirs, and maybe people all around the world will say, I want an African computer. What is an Apple computer? What is an iPod? An iPod is a hard disk in hot pants. This is where we go here. Now, I've talked to people all talk about facts. We've seen lots of charts and so on and so forth. What I want to say is that what will mobilize change in many ways is actually dreams, longings, desires, fantasies. This is all the, the subconscious stew that produces fiction. So how I understand foreign cultures is often through film. When people are making love or making war, you can tell something about them. This film, Hong Kong made film, it's a trilogy, it's fantastically, enormously well made, and was reversioned as Scorsese's last movie, The Departed. Now, the African equivalent is Nollywood, and you will hear later about Nollywood. This is sold on DVDs all across West Africa. This is the B-movie of Africa. How did this happen? Because actually with digital technology, you can make low entry into the market. And the same digital technology is capable of creating digital cinemas, because digital projectors are very cheap now. So all of this product that we've been seeing up on the screen, which unless it's been on television in Africa, almost nobody will have seen, is capable of being shown in digital cinemas that will make money in the future. Final thing, pay TV. Pay TV was, until very recently, a monopoly run by a South African company called DSTV. Another company has entered the market. That company is interested in doing local content. So media markets will begin to emerge so that there will be ways of imagining and talking about the new Africa as it puts itself into place. I think one of the strange things about working in Africa is time and time again, people have that little shrugging motion and they look at their feet and they go, oh, this is Africa, when the water's not working, the electricity's not working, the internet's not working. I think that there are people in this room who have the ideas, the energy, and the imagination to be able to reach a situation where we can say, this is Africa, and be proud. Thank you.